Logical control. In this The final processing of filtrate in the late distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts comes under direct physiological control. In this region, membrane permeabilities and cellular activities are altered in response to the body's need to retain or excrete specific substances. Your goals for learning are to understand the role of the hormone aldosterone in the reabsorption of sodium and secretion of potassium, to examine the role of the antidiuretic hormone in the concentration of urine, to understand the role of the medullary osmotic gradient in the concentration of urine. Here's what you need to know. The structure of the nephron, the permeability characteristics of nephron regions, the definition of osmolarity, how the medullary osmotic gradient is formed. To review the structure of the nephron or how the medullary osmotic gradient is formed, click the appropriate link button. If you use a link button, you can return to the page you started from by clicking the return button. To see definitions of terms, click the bold red words. The bulk of reabsorption occurs in the early tubular segments. In these regions, the rates of both reabsorption and secretion are relatively constant because the membrane permeabilities are relatively fixed. In the later tubular segments you are about to tour, the membrane permeabilities change in response to changing physiological conditions and hormone levels. This variability provides a mechanism for precisely regulating the final balance of fluid and solutes returned to the blood. An analogy for this two-stage process would be to use a steady but unregulated flow to fill a container to almost the level needed. That's early filtrate processing. Then use a precisely regulated flow of water to top off to the exact level. That's late filtrate processing. To demonstrate this analogy, fill this graduated cylinder with water to exactly 70 milliliters. First, click the faucet and fill the graduated cylinder to about 65 milliliters. Then click the pipette to fill the cylinder to exactly 70 milliliters. Good. This bulk filling is analogous to the reabsorption of water and solutes occurring in the early tubular segments. Now, fine-tune the amount using the pipette. Underfilled, please add more. Underfilled, please add more. Perfect, your filling was precise. This fine tuning is analogous to late filtrate processing. Oops, that's a little too much. The epithelium of the late distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts consists of two cell types, principal cells and intercalated cells. Each plays a different role in the final processing of filtrate. The intercalated cells help to balance the blood pH by secreting hydrogen ions into the filtrate through ATPase pumps in the luminal membrane. In contrast, the principal cells perform hormonally regulated water and sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. Click the principal cell on the right to see its activity. The principal cells are permeable to sodium ions and water only in the presence of the hormones aldosterone from the adrenal gland, an antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, from the posterior pituitary gland. Let's first look at the role of aldosterone, which precisely regulates the final amount of sodium reabsorbed. When levels of sodium and potassium ions in the blood are balanced, aldosterone levels remain low. As a result, there are few sodium-potassium ATPase ion pumps in the basolateral membrane and few sodium and potassium channels in the luminal membrane. Therefore, sodium ion reabsorption and potassium ion secretion are both low. However, a decrease in the level of sodium ions or an increase in potassium ions will trigger the release of aldosterone. Click the adrenal gland on top of the kidney icon to see the results of increasing aldosterone levels on these cells.
In response to increased aldosterone, both sodium ion reabsorption and potassium ion secretion increase. This occurs because the principal cells increase the number and activity of sodium-potassium pumps in the basolateral membrane. The number of sodium and potassium channels in the luminal membrane is also increased. Notice the absence of potassium channels in the basolateral membrane. Potassium ions enter the cell through the basolateral membrane, but instead of diffusing back into the interstitium, they diffuse to the luminal membrane and are secreted into the filtrate. Also notice the resulting increase in interstitial osmolarity. Water is not following the solute because the luminal membrane is relatively impermeable to water unless it is stimulated by ADH. Under most normal conditions, an increase in aldosterone occurs along with an increase in antidiuretic hormone. The reabsorption of salt is usually coupled with reabsorption of water, although they can occur independently. The cell you see here has been stimulated as yet only by aldosterone, so it is still impermeable to water. Click the pituitary gland of the brain icon to release ADH and see its effect. When stimulated by ADH, principal cells quickly insert luminal water channels, increasing their water permeability. Notice that the interstitial osmolarity decreases. When water molecules can diffuse through a membrane, osmolarities on each side of the membrane equilibrate. Now let's look at two common conditions to demonstrate how these two hormones function in our everyday lives. Click the dehydration button to see how the hormones respond when you lose fluid through perspiration. Or click the overhydration button to see how they respond to a high fluid intake. In dehydration, which could be caused by hot weather, perspiration causes the body to lose both water and sodium. In response, both ADH and aldosterone are released. They stimulate the kidney to conserve body fluid by increasing reabsorption of water and sodium ions from the filtrate. Therefore, the volume of filtrate entering the medullary collecting duct is reduced, so urine volume decreases. Overhydration, which could be caused by drinking several cans of soda or other beverages, triggers a decrease in ADH and aldosterone levels. As a result, membrane permeability for water and sodium ions decreases, reabsorption slows dramatically, and the volume of filtrate entering the medullary collecting duct increases above the normal level, causing urine volume to increase. High urine volumes also occur when substances containing diuretic chemicals are consumed. We are now ready for the final concentration of the filtrate as it enters the medullary collecting duct. Let's first set the stage. Recall from the early filtrate processing topic that the asymmetrical pattern of reabsorption in the ascending and descending loop of Henle created an osmotic gradient in the renal medulla. Here again is the schematic medullary gradient. The dark color in the deeper regions of the gradient represents a high solute concentration that gradually changes to the lighter, low solute concentration near the cortex. The solutes forming the gradient are sodium and chloride ions and other substances, including urea. We now add osmolarity indicators in milliosmol units and a schematic diagram of the tubules and collecting ducts. Using this schematic diagram, let's review how filtrate concentration in the tubules is related to interstitial osmolarity. Watch the changes in the concentration and volume of the filtrate as it passes through the differing osmotic environments of the cortex and medulla. Click the proximal convoluted tubule to start this process. Since the cells of the PCT are highly permeable to both solutes and water, the relative osmolarity of the filtrate remains equal to the 300 milliosmol solute concentration of the interstitium. 
the cell's high permeability also accounts for a 65% reduction in filtrate volume. Click the descending loop of Henley to see the changes that occur there. Watch the simulated drop of filtrate as it moves down the tube to the bottom of the loop. Notice that the osmolarity of the filtrate increases and the volume decreases. Recall that the cells of this region are permeable to water but not to solute. As the filtrate moves down the tube through regions of higher osmolarity, water diffuses out into the interstitium, reducing the filtrate volume by an additional 15%. The solutes remain behind in the tubule and become more concentrated as the filtrate approaches the bottom of the loop. Allow the filtrate to continue by clicking the ascending loop of Henle. The cells of a thick segment of the ascending loop of Henle are permeable to solute but not to water, making them function essentially opposite to the cells of the thin segment of the descending loop. As the concentrated filtrate flows up the ascending loop, the cells actively transport solutes into the interstitium, causing the osmolarity of the filtrate to fall to less than 300 milliosmoles. Because water remains in the tubule, the filtrate volume remains unchanged. The opposing flow and opposite activities of the descending and ascending segments of the loop of Henle is called the countercurrent multiplier mechanism. Now click the late distal convoluted tubule or cortical collecting duct to see the changes occurring there. The osmolarity of the filtrate entering the late DCT and cortical collecting duct can be as low as 100 milliosmoles. Recall that in the cells of this region, the reabsorption of sodium ions and water is regulated by the hormones aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. In normal hydration conditions, low levels of both hormones promote the reabsorption of sodium ions and water from the filtrate. This maintains the low osmolarity of the filtrate while reducing its volume by an additional 15%. You can click any region of the nephron to review its action. The last step in the formation of urine occurs as the filtrate passes down the medullary collecting duct. Of the 125 milliliters per minute of filtrate that entered the proximal convoluted tubule from the glomerular capsule, 95% has been reabsorbed back into the blood. Only about 6 milliliters per minute, or 5%, remains to enter the medullary collecting duct. Antidiuretic hormone regulates the final amount of water reabsorbed in the collecting duct and thus determines the final concentration of urine. We will now see how the medullary osmotic gradient provides the necessary environment for this final concentration. The osmotic gradient constructed by the countercurrent multiplier mechanism concentrates the urine by drawing water from the filtrate as it travels through the medullary collecting duct. However, the degree of concentration is regulated by antidiuretic hormone, which controls the water permeability of the duct. As seen earlier in this topic, ADH levels vary in response to various conditions, including the individual's hydration status. Select the normal level of hydration first by clicking the normal button and then compare that condition with the other two hydration levels. Notice the effect of each condition on the drop of filtrate traveling down the medullary collecting duct. With normal hydration and levels of ADH, water channels are present in the luminal membranes of these cells, resulting in moderate water permeability. ADH also facilitates the diffusion of urea out of the medullary collecting duct into the interstitium. Although it is considered a nitrogenous waste product, urea is responsible for up to 40% of the medullary interstitial osmolarity. From the interstitium, urea passively re-enters the filtrate in the loop of Henle and recirculates back to the collecting ducts. It may then again diffuse into the interstitium or pass into the renal pelvis as a component of urine. Notice that as it descends, the filtrate drop shrinks in volume and darkens slightly as water is lost and solutes are concentrated. 
the filtrate does not equilibrate with the osmolarity of all medullary regions, and is therefore not as concentrated as possible. Normal urine has an osmolarity of about 600 milliosmoles, or twice normal body osmolarity. With overhydration, ADH levels are very low or absent, and the duct cells remain relatively impermeable to water and urea. The reduction in urea permeability decreases the medullary interstitial osmotic gradient, reducing the water drawing power of the interstitium. As the filtrate passes through the lumen of the medullary collecting duct, it does not equilibrate with any regional change in osmolarity and therefore remains unmodified. Notice that the filtrate drop remains the same size and color as it descends through the duct. The final urine, which is dilute and high in volume, may have an osmolarity as low as 100 milliosmoles. With dehydration, a high level of ADH creates two important changes. First, it causes additional luminal water channels to be added to the duct, which increases its permeability to water. Second, it increases the permeability of the duct to urea, which in turn increases the interstitial osmolarity. This increased osmolarity draws additional water from the filtrate. Therefore, as the filtrate passes through the lumen of the duct, it equilibrates with each regional increase in osmolarity. Notice the decrease in size and darkening color of the filtrate drop as it descends through the duct. In severe dehydration conditions, the low volume of urine excreted may be concentrated to about 1400 milliosmoles, or more than four times the osmolarity of normal body fluids. Now let's look at the final volume of urine produced per minute and per day for each of the levels of hydration you have just seen. Recall that 95% of the water has been reabsorbed from the 125 milliliters per minute of glomerular filtrate produced by the kidney before the filtrate enters the medullary collecting duct. Click the beaker to remove this volume. Then select one of the hydration buttons to see the final volume of urine. With high levels of antidiuretic hormone, the approximate final urine volume is 0.2% of the filtrate. This is equal to one-fourth of a milliliter per minute, or 400 milliliters per day. Two conditions in which this might occur would be severe dehydration or blood loss. With normal levels of antidiuretic hormone, about 99% of the filtrate is reabsorbed into the blood. This leaves about 0.9% or 1.1 milliliters per minute of concentrated urine to continue the passage into the renal pelvis and urinary bladder. This equals about 1 and 1 half liters per day. With low levels of antidiuretic hormone, the approximate final urine volume is 12.5% of the filtrate. This is equal to 16 milliliters per minute, or 22 and a half liters per day. This situation might be caused by either temporary or chronic conditions. High volumes of dilute urine are temporarily produced after a person drinks either a large volume of fluid or fluids that contain diuretic drugs, such as caffeine or alcohol. In a chronic condition called diabetes insipidus, urinary volume may reach extremely high levels, because either antidiuretic hormone is not released by the posterior pituitary or the tubular cells do not bind and respond to this hormone. Here's a summary of what we've covered. Late filtrate processing includes both reabsorption and secretion. Late filtrate processing of sodium, potassium, water, and urea is under direct control of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. The medullary osmotic gradient and ADH both contribute to final urine concentration. In normal conditions, about 99% of the glomerular filtrate is reabsorbed during its passage through the tubules and ducts. To test your knowledge, click the quiz button to go to the self-quiz.